Let's computer. Go back to screen share. Looks like we can get started. We got a lot of people now. Uh, we get started. Bedroom, what do you think? Um, I think we should get started because we're kind of on a tight um, schedule. Okay. So floor is yours, Dr. Far. Okay, thank you. Screen share. I, uh, it's my privilege today to uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Robert Gish, uh, who will be giving a talk uh, on, on liver disease and when to transfer a liver patient to the ICU. Dr. Gish went to medical school at the University of Kansas. It is medicine residency at UC San Diego and a four-year gastroenterology and hepatology fellowship at UCLA. Uh, he is extremely well known in the uh, liver, hepatology world. He's served on the editorial boards of a number of magazines, a number of uh, publishing uh, published magazines like the American Journal of Gastroenterology, Hepatology, Digestive Diseases and Sciences, and Gastroenterology, among many others. He himself has published more than 700 original articles, review articles, abstracts, and book chapters. He's currently an adjunct professor of medicine at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and University of Nevada, Reno. And Bob, it's really just a great privilege to introduce you and have you with us today, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Dr. Farr, really appreciate it. Uh Edrim for your efforts, Dr. Risby for helping us market this and get this out to as many people as possible. I am recording this. I'm going to try to get this posted on my website. And if I can figure out the Zoom recording correctly, I could even share those files with you all if you want these um, your drives uh, also for teaching long term. And I thought this would be really good to start out with this issue about taking care of liver patients in the hospital, thinking about should they be on the ward, should they be in the ICU. Of course, we'll talk about discharge and transfer to a liver transplant center. Those are all um, important issues. Uh, just for operational purposes, if everybody could mute themselves and then uh, we'll have a Q&A at the end, if that's okay. And that would be absolutely fantastic. So let's uh, get going here. I'm just going to figure out how to slide forward. I have a website that's very, very active and lots of downloads, a lot of teaching files. Please sign up for my newsletter. It'll be very useful to you long term. A little bit more on when to consider a transfer. Rules, guidelines, guidance, uh, advice, pearls will be part of this. So the first thing I'd like to talk about here is liver enzymes and liver function. Probably in your teaching, people have used the word liver function test when they meant liver enzymes. So I'm going to ask you going forward to be really separate about these two. Liver enzymes is AST, ALT, alkaline phosphatase, and GGT. All of your liver panels should include a GGT. Liver function. Total bilirubin is good, but direct bilirubin is better. So if you've got a liver patient in the hospital, please fractionate the bilirubin. And when we discuss this or you discuss it among yourselves, be tracking that direct bilirubin and total bilirubin. Albumin is good. INR is okay. But we're gonna talk about TEG, T-E-G, and have a whole presentation on TEG very soon, thromboelastography. And I want you to think starting today that you're gonna to switch from INR to TEG for all of your liver patients. And you may use this on many other services as we bring this forward. Bicarb, factor five, factor seven are good liver function tests as well. What we say about ammonia testing is ammonia testing. Well, the people that order ammonia testing are usually more confused than their patients. So we're going to try to take ammonia testing almost off of your workup of a liver patient, except in very rare settings. Encephalopathy, you're going to work up patients by doing a physical, by doing memory tests, taking a fall history, looking at sleep disorder, looking at handwriting, but not ammonia testing. Don't treat the ammonia treat the patient. It's a little bit more in ammonia testing. This comes from the guidance. Poor correlation. And lactulose, in my opinion, is way overused. The patients are miserable, the nurses are miserable, and you're really not improving the patient unless you're using our multi-factor encephalopathy protocol, which we'll get into. Where do I check for ammonia? Unexplained coma. Somebody with normal liver tests that's in a coma because they may have urea cycle deficiency. And I have 
diagnosed over 20 people as adults with urea cycle deficiencies. The only other place I consider ammonia testing is in the acute hepatic failure patient and it's prognostic if the ammonia drawn from a very well handled venous specimen or arterial specimen preferred is over 100, it helps with acute liver failure prognosis. Every patient in the hospital who's got cirrhosis every day should have a CTP score, child Tercot Pew score in the chart, and also a meld sodium in the chart. Meld plus sodium, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Grade the encephalopathy every day. Grade zero, grade one, two, three, four. How much ascites? None, mild, moderate. Total bilirubin, albumin, and INR. Just tell me, it's a child's A6 or a B8 or a C12. Very important to have the CP, CPT score. Encephalopathy grading, how do you do that? Well, you check asterixis, sleep pattern, memory, handwriting, speech pattern, aggressive, are they irritable? You can mu do muscle rigidity, do reflex testing. We really don't do EEGs in most of these patients. You could just do a good physical. Treat the patient, not the ammonia. Just stop checking ammonia testing and your life will become much easier. Asterixis is key, but if you have a grade three or grade four, they should be in an ICU or transfer to a liver center or a liver transplant center if they're a liver transplant candidate. Part of our agenda, our curriculum this year is we'll have a separate talk on who's a candidate for a liver trans transplant. And if we get our dream move forward, we'll have a much more formal uh, liver management service at St. Agnes, which is uh, in process. MELD, M-E-L-D, model for end-stage liver disease. You plug in the creatinine, bilirubin, INR, and now you'll plug in a sodium, you'll get a sodium MELD score. That will tell you how sick the patient is. It goes from six to 40. A six is in good shape. 15, those patients need to be thought of as a liver transplant candidate, potentially. 25 to 30 range, they should be at a transplant center if they're a transplant candidate. Very simple rules with MELD. And MELD was set up to tell us who could be a candidate for a tip shunt. Who is gonna live or die with a tip shunt? Now there's two different rules. An acute GI bleed, high MELD score doesn't help you too much because they may have a high bilirubin from blood loss or blood transfusions. And we're putting tips in very commonly in patients who have acute GI bleed from esophageal or gastric varices. So we'll talk about that patient by patient. But a person with chronic cirrhosis, ascites, GI bleed with a child's Tercot Pew score, say 10, you're not gonna to wanna to put in a tip shunt if their MELD score is over 20. So some simple rules. MELD score gives you 30 day, 90 day and one year survival or one year mortality. We'll talk about those graphs on a subsequent presentation. ICU or transplant center, meld over 25. Meld sodium, just go online. You also wanna know if the patient's been on dialysis, run with the creatinine, bilirubin, INR, and sodium. This has been modified because with the sodium, it gave a better sensitivity for mortality risk when the sodium meld, the meld range was in the 20 to 25 range. Meld over 15, call me, call a transplant center to discuss care. Meld over 25, transfer. ICU or liver transplant center. All right, hepatorenal syndrome. We're gonna shift gears here a little bit. If you think a patient has a hepatorenal syndrome developing, rising creatinine, you really need to think about putting them either in the ICU or some type of step-down unit because they're going to need close monitoring, blood pressure, electrolytes, creatinine changes. They're going to need MOA, midodrin, octreotide, albumin. Albumin is a fantastic, what I call a liquid organ. 
albumin in our cirrhotic in patients needs to be used in selected cases, but liberally. Albumin also very useful to improve survival in patients with SVP. But here, hepatorenal, MOA, we were hoping that this month the FDA was going to approve a new drug for hepatorenal syndrome called terlipressin. But the company got a letter saying, we need more information. So we're not sure when this new drug will be approved, but I can tell you 50 other countries in the world where I can use terlipressin five years ago, including today. So we're a little bit slow in the US sometimes in getting new drugs, new technologies that we know work. AKI in the setting of cirrhosis, do orthostatics, look for hypovolemia, could be induced by diuretics, GI bleeding, or diarrhea. And here's a problem. You give people lactulose, they get diarrhea, you get hypovolemic, they get AKI, and they get encephalopathic. They actually can make the encephalopathy worse with lactulose. Or they can have epidorenal if you've ruled out non steroidals and antibiotics that may be nephrotoxic. When you do your ultrasound of your abdomen, look at the kidney size. Small shrunken kidneys, they probably have chronic kidney disease of some type. They could have glomerulonephritis from cryoglobulins from hepatitis C. You're going to rule out obstruction with that abdominal ultrasound. So full abdominal ultrasound with Doppler, with spleen size, portal vein diameter, and look at the kidneys. Obstruction, size are very important. When is it HRS? Well, you've ruled out other things. Everybody with hepatorenal syndrome, has ascites. They don't have ascites. It's not hepatorenal syndrome. This ascites club, ICA, International Ascites Club, or IAC, has clear AKA criteria. Give no response to a creatinine change two consecutive days after diuretic withdrawal and some volume expansion with albumin. It's very likely to be hepatorenal syndrome. Again, after you've ruled out shock, infection, obstruction. You have to say absence of proteinuria, so do a urine dipstick, look for hematuria, and again, normal renal ultrasound. Very, very important. A little bit on pathogenesis, but the bottom line is you've got portal hypertension, you have ascites, you have the splachnic arteriovasodilatation, your effective arterial volumes are down. Then you get activation of this renin angiotensin system, um, uh, vasopressin system also, and then you get renal vasoconstriction. <clears throat> so, midodrine and octreotide improve renal function. Albumin, magical substance, it's absorbing toxins, it's improving vascular endothelial health, it's moderating inflammatory mediators, chemokines, cytokines, nitric oxide is part of this. Bacterial translocation, there's a lot of that taking place when there's blood in the GI tract. In portal hypertension, there's lots of bacterial translocation. You'll see a lot of our outpatients that we'll be seeing here in Fresno being on probiotics. Now, I don't use probiotics in an inpatient setting because there's too many things that are going on. But also think about every patient with cirrhosis needs to have a cardiac echo. You need to be looking for cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, LV dysfunction, E to A slope on a cardiac echo, very important. That's a little bit of a case. Progressive renal failure despite albumin. Creatinine has jumped to 2.5. Worsening urine output. Blood pressure, 80 over 40. MELD's been upgraded, discussing renal replacement therapy. And anybody with cirrhosis who needs renal replacement therapy should be on CVVH. You should not be using dialysis in these patients. It's going to make the hypotension worse, worsening liver perfusion, liver function, worsening renal perfusion. Very important. But midodrine is very useful. It's an alpha agonist. It raises that blood pressure. If you have a patient that's sick in the hospital, think about moving to the ICU, low blood pressure, you're also going to work them up for adrenal insufficiency. In the hospital setting, 50% of these patients will have adrenal insufficiency, hepato 
adrenal. And you're going to supplement them with Solucortef 60Q6 or 80Q6 or 80Q8 for three days. Very important test while you're pending cortisol, free cortisol, cortisol binding globulin, a triple cortisol workup. Big pearl here today, hepatoadrenal. ICU, you can think about dopamine. We really are switching a little bit more to norepi over dopamine or over epinephrine. So norepi is preferred these days. And again, midodrin, deoctreotide is sub-Q, not a drip that you might be using in GI bleeding. 100 mics, Q, Q8. Midodrin, you can take up to 20 TID, although 10 TID is typically uh, quite useful. IV albumin, 0 0.5 to 1 gram per kilo. You want to bring the uh, total albumin up to around 3.2 to 3.4. You don't want to go too high on the albumin level. Norepi, as I mentioned, is my preferred if you're going to use intravenous vasopressor support. Terlopressin is not available in the U.S. I was hoping this week it was going to be approved, but I think they changed their PDUFA date. Midodrin we talked about, here's dosing, 15 to 20 TID, maybe 15 is max. Keep the maps around 70, 75. Systolic blood pressure, you really want 90 to 95. Octreotide, you can do infusions, but I'm just recommending sub-Q TID. This is terlopressin, just a, what the structure looks like. Less effect on cardiac status, more effect on renal perfusion. This is a terlopressin albumin versus midodrin octreotide albumin. Terlopressin looks better, better response, partial response, incomplete response. And this is the data that was going to go to the FDA as well as another larger study that was performed recently. The FDA did not like the risk benefit ratio. I don't know what the real risks of terlopressin are, minor side effects, but the FDA is all knowledgeable. A little bit more on 90 day survival. Look at this data, impressive in terms of the terlopressin group compared to midodrin octreotide. Especially important to see if there's a response. If you have a response, you continue your MOA. If you're not responding, you need to go down another pathway. This is talks about the confirmed study terlopressin plus albumin versus albumin alone uh, and verified reversal, a change in renal replacement therapy, avoiding liver transplant, serum creatinine changes. Oh, these are all important endpoints that took place. You can see in the confirmed study, basically a doubling of renal syndrome reversal, p-value 0.012. This is a, more about the FDA data. Adverse events. Look at the difference here. A little bit more abdominal pain, a little bit more nausea, a little bit more diarrhea. I'm not sure the dyspnea might be a central effect. I don't think it's a pulmonary effect. Respiratory failure, a little bit higher. I'm not sure also if the terlopressin or this was group-based in terms of patient-based a little bit different in hepatic encephalopathy. And this is probably the data that the FDA might have been concerned about, but hepatorenal syndrome, once that diagnosis is made, mortality rate in those individuals is over 80% at less than a year. So hepatorenal syndrome is really is terlopressin versus norepi. Their noradrenaline is my preferred presser. Terlopressin here for cumulative survival was better. This drug to me, benefit outweighs risks, but we're gonna wait for the FDA's next comments. Epidorenal syndrome, acute kidney injury, HRS, that's the new term, AKI, HRS versus AKI alone. No sepsis, absence of other renotoxic results, you reverse any hypovolemia, treated or managed any cardiac events that are going on in these individuals. Right now, MOA is our best with norepi as our best 
suppressor on top of metadrine. Rule out epidoadrenal syndrome. We're going to switch to GI bleeding. We'll talk about these over the course of the year in some more detail, but I put this in this package, thinking this would be a great intro. Talk about management in the hospital, moving to the ICU, or moving to a transplant center. When to transfer? Recurrent GI bleeding, not amenable to banding or sclero, or TIPS. And think about a TIPS shunt early in these patients. TIPS shunts in randomized studies, these patients have done better if they are bleeding after your first endoscopy. Banding, highly preferred over sclerotherapy. Gastric varices management, it's either endoscopic coil plus glue or a tip shunt. So if there isn't availability here of coiling and gluing gastric varices, then move to a tips shunt early. ICU care is critical. If they're GI bleeding, hypotensive, they need to be in an ICU. Think about a couple of other issues. Ascites we're gonna get into in more detail, but I'm gonna put a pearl out on the table just for a moment about ascites. Every patient should be having a paracentesis in the emergency room or with an hour of hitting the floor. Ultrasound guidance, don't check coags, draw the ascites, send two blood culture bottles, fluid in two blood culture bottles at the bedside to the lab, albumin level, protein, cell count with diff. These GI bleeders may present with GI bleeding and ascites. Now, of course, you want their GI bleed stabilized before you do the paracentesis, getting sort of a general rule and then with that caveat. You all know in GI bleeders, portal hypertensive GI bleeders, they should all be on IV antibiotics for three days. But back to the paracentesis, you don't even need to check a TAG or an INR, just get the paracentesis done. There were a thousand paracentesis done at Mayo Clinic by a nurse practitioner with one bleeding complication. None of the thousand patients had any coag checks done. Now, if you're gonna do a large volume paracentesis with a large needle, you're gonna be taking off six or eight liters, then we'll talk about checking a TAG, not an INR, and that'll be built into a talk that we'll do very soon. Thromboelastography, should be your coagulation assessment of choice in all of your acute liver failure or your cirrhotic patients to check their coag status. So GI bleeding, IV octreotide, 50 mic bolus, 50 to 100 mics per hour infusion, IV antibiotics, three days. You can put them on PO to finish a seven day course if indicated. You've got that urgent EGD, we usually say 12, 24 hours, preferably within 12 hours. But you want them stabilized. You want the, their hemoglobin, instead of being four, up into the seven to eight range. Tip shunt, we talked about, meld 23 to 25, but that's case by case. IV PPIs, oral PPIs, but you want to get them off the proton pump inhibitors early, meaning four to six weeks. These proton pump inhibitors increase the risk for bacterial peritonitis. They increase the risk for C. difficile. So long-term PPIs should be in very selected patients. Non-selected beta blockers, Nadalol or propranolol, can be started three to four days after the patient's stabilized. I don't like beta blockers very much. I prefer to do banding and obliterate the varices and only use beta blockers if I can't bring those varices under good control with banding or if they have portal hypertensive gastropathy or gastric varices. But for the purpose of boards, it's going to be banding plus beta blockers. Beta blockers make people tired, run down. Uh, you're trying to get them to exercise. You can't get their heart rate up. Sexual dysfunction, they interfere with diabetes management. And once you get a little bit later with moderate to severe ascites, the beta blockers worsen mortality. We'll talk about that in some subsequent lectures. Banding is so much better than sclerotherapy. Very few patients need sclerotherapy today. It's maybe less than 1%. It's really banding that's the key. Very safe procedure. And remember, you can always put an NG tube down in a GI bleeder, GI bleeders. NG tubes. NG tubes do not worsen or do not cause a risk of bleeding. Even after bands are put on, 
you can put down an NG tube. Very, very smooth, very easy. A little bit more in some pictures here, what the bands look like on these varices. This makes it look simple, but when you're down there and they're massively bleeding, you may have to put a lavage tube in, lavage their stomach till it's empty, and then get them back. And while you're waiting for all this, be running a thromboelastogram and then deciding based on the tag whether they need coagulation support. We'll get back to that. And G tubes, definitely want that stomach emptied for that GI bleed. This is much easier to manage in the ICU than on the ward, but it just depends on what their blood pressure is, their hemoglobin, uh, they're actively vomiting blood, they vomited blood a day ago. So you really gotta take a history and then select people for the ward or the ICU with your gastroenterology consultant. Rarely are you gonna use a Minnesota tube or what's called a Sangstock and Blakemore tube. I personally have put down a hundred of these tubes. Hopefully you won't see this very much. This is somebody who's got large gastric varices or esophageal varices that aren't responding to banding. Can't take them to a TIPS or you might use this as a bridge to a TIPS, but hopefully you're only gonna see this a couple times a year. This is a tip shunt diagram. So you can see in the A in the upper left corner, you've got a catheter coming in through the transjugular vein into an hepatic vein. There's a probe that goes across, finds the portal vein. You slip another catheter over that, and the balloon directed catheter. That balloon takes oh, and then you launch the stent or the shunt over that. So the basic rule is meld less than 20 for chronic liver disease. People might be getting a, a tips for ascites or GI bleeding on top of known chronic liver disease. If you have an acute GI bleeder whose meld score two weeks ago was five and now it's 30, well, it's probably being driven by the bilirubin from all the blood transfusions or blood in the GI tract. You can put a tips in those if they're not easily controlled with that first endoscopy and that first banding. And you've got a fantastic interventional radiology team uh, led by Sean Tower at St. Agnes, who's a super expert at putting these in. A little bit more on ascites. When do you transfer a patient, ICU or to a transplant center? Intractable ascites, you're not sure about putting in a TIPS. Or hepatic hydrothorax, it's not being controlled with diuretics. We do not put in chest tubes for hepatic hydrothorax. We'll put in a tip shunt, but we really want to control that hydrothorax with ascites. But you can take out fluid looking for infection, malignancy, TB, coxy. Got severe pain, that pain management with ascites could be done in the ICU while you're bringing that fluid under control with large volume paracentesis and considering a TIPS. Hypoxemia, of course, you're going to move them to the ICU. They may need to be intubated while you're managing that tense ascites. Very rare, as I mentioned, you're going to use chest tubes. Uh, very common to be considering tips in these patients. If you're transferring to the ICU, you should be thinking about a tips. So chest pain, always have an EKG, of course. Cirrhosis with ascites. You're always going to get a paracentesis. And you get that paracentesis done early, quickly, ultrasound guidance. Don't check coags. Emergency room, we'd really like the ED here to be doing that paracentesis because sometimes they see the patient with ascites, they're on the ward eight hours later, then you can't get the uh, paracentesis till the next morning. Suddenly you've got a 16 hour delay when there should just be a one hour delay. Ultrasound guidance is just preferred anymore. It's standard of care. Just get a portable ultrasound, guide that. And we talked about making sure the fluid is sent for culture, blood culture bottles at the bedside, total protein, albumin, and cell count. Now the cell count on ascites for boards, ANC, absolute neutrophil count over 250, supports SVP. But my rule is through my 30 years of experience, any absolute neutrophil count over 50 needs to be treated as SVP. If the patient isn't looking good at day three, you do a repeat tap and reassess the neutrophil count. The neutrophil count's going up, you have picked the wrong antibiotics. We usually start out with ceftriaxone or Zosin, easily early add Vanco, 
white counts going up, you're going to be thinking about something else. And that's why you do the culture and blood culture bottles, because you can pick up anaerobes using that technique, which are missed with standard culture techniques. If you draw ascites, send it in a tube down to the lab, and they wait four hours to culture it, everything's dead in that fluid in just an hour. So it not only should be in the blood culture bottles, that extra tube that goes down to the lab should be hand delivered to the lab so they get their cultures going within a few minutes. Well, there's a few other things you can send. You can send glucose, LDH, amylase, lipids, lipid profile for triglycerides, AFB, cytology, bilirubin if you think there's a bile leak, cholesterol actually, and adenosine, which is actually not on here, um, are tests that can be used to look for TB or fungal infections in the ascites. But these are very special uh, cases. Albumin for SPP, I'm not going to go into all this data because I know we're on a time uh, scale here, but uh, there's plenty of data that albumin infusion uh, is useful. And what I basically do is give them 10 to 12 grams, uh, sorry, 10 to 12 milligrams per kilo twice a day for the first day, then a second and third day, and try to keep their total albumin around 3.2 to 3.4. Large volume paracentesis, you can take four, six, 10 liters off. Once you're over four liters, you need to be giving albumin per liter removed, especially if the albumin's low, especially if the blood pressure's low, especially if the renal function is marginal. This albumin really helps support blood pressure. And as I mentioned, albumin is like a liquid organ. It binds all sorts of different toxins, improving renal function, improving nutrition. Tips, very effective. May still need a little bit of diuretics, but before you send somebody home after a tips for, uh, for ascites management, negotiate with either me or your gastro consultants what dose level they should go home on. I usually cut the dose by 75%. All of the stents now are covered and stenosis and clotting is rare. We occasionally put in a TIPS and anticoagulate patients afterwards, um, but that's on a case-by-case -case basis. Your radiologist can put a uh, thread through portal vein thrombosis, core out that and put in a tip shunt. That is something that's possible. I had a patient with massive GI bleeding at my clinic in Folsom, California, who ended up getting transferred to Stanford. They put in a transplanted catheter and opened up the portal vein and put in a tips shunt transplanically. This patient did not have cirrhosis. He had portal vein thrombosis from a hypercoagulable state superimposed on nodular regenerative hyperplasia. But he's on long-term anticoagulants because otherwise he would clot that tip shunt. If there's a liver cancer, you're not gonna put in a TIPS. There are surgeons who still do portal systemic shunts, but these are extremely rare. I'm not even sure how many are being done at the big centers in Los Angeles, San Francisco, uh, but this is an option if they're not a candidate for a tip shot or the tip shot has failed. But if you're thinking of tips, you still have to be thinking about liver transplant, but we're going to have a separate lecture on liver transplant selection, who you, who you refer, who gets evaluated, who gets declined. It's complicated because we have 60,000 people dying of liver failure in the U.S. and we only have 7,000 livers, so we have to be selective. Uh, same diagram on TIPS. Okay, let's switch now to acute liver failure. This means hepatic encephalopathy within two weeks to three months of the onset of jaundice. So you need to have jaundice, acute jaundice, high liver enzymes, hepatic encephalopathy, rapid onset, much higher risk for cerebral edema, slow onset, lower risk of cirrhosis with encephalopathy, extremely low risk of hepatic, sorry, of cerebral edema. These are all the different causes of acute liver failure. And we work through steps, one, two, three, we try to get these, this work up for everything done within three to four days of somebody coming in with acute liver failure. 
And again, acute liver failure patients depends on the cause, but you need to be thinking about referral to a transplant center when the MELD score is over 15 to 20. Do a TAG. Of course, you're gonna need an INR to calculate a CPT score and to calculate a MELD score. You're gonna work them up for infection, bleeding, shock, cardiac disease with a cardiac echo. But up top, you're gonna to be doing a workup for hepatitis A, B, C, E, a, B, C, E, acute liver failure, A, B, C, E. You only do D or Delta if somebody is surface antigen positive. An autoimmune workup is easy. Globulins, ANA, smooth muscle. That's the first level. And there are second level autoimmune tests we'll talk about later. Think about Epstein-Barr. I saw an Epstein-Barr liver failure patient in Las Vegas two weeks ago. Serpy simplex, herpes zoster. Every patient with acute liver injury must have a blood alcohol level and an acetaminophen level in their chart immediately with the first lab draw. If they're under 55, you need to do a Wilson disease workup. That's a ceruloplasmin at a minimum 24-hour urine copper liver biopsy. Every patient with acute liver injury gets a Doppler ultrasound of their liver. Portal vein Doppler, hepatic vein Doppler, of course, they're gonna look at the hepatic artery as well. So these are some really important take home points. The big pearls here again, acute liver injury. Everybody gets a sedimentophen level. Everybody gets an alcohol level. And we think through the rest of this as well. Okay, we've gone through definitions, coagulopathy. Yeah, you're gonna order an INR, but you'll have a tag in the chart as well. You're gonna be doing your mental status evaluations every day if they're in the ICU, probably multiple times a day. Go back and make sure it's not acute on chronic. Do a good assessment. If somebody in the chart had a platelet count of 105,000 with AST elevated greater than ALT, they probably got early cirrhosis. And if they look like they're going into liver failure, it's, we're gonna call it acute on chronic grade two encephalopathy or greater, you're going to be thinking about the ICU. Grade three or four, they have to be in the ICU. And if they're a transplant candidate, we'll be in touch with the transplant center and I can help guide you down that route. Glucose, extremely important in acute liver failure. Hypoglycemic seizures can kill a patient, can kill their brain. Always get a blood phosphorus level at baseline and daily for at least three days. Aggressively supplement the phosphorus. We talk about INR and TAG, you're gonna follow liver panels at least once a day. Direct bilirubin, total bilirubin, direct bilirubin. We'll talk more about acute hepatitis in another lecture. Admit until proven otherwise. Transfer to the ICU when they're going from grade two to grade three HE. ICU care, if the creatinine has risen by 0.3, confirm. You're going to admit, even if they don't have encephalopathy, if they have a low glucose, low phosphorus, and if you can't monitor glucose is frequently on the ward or phosphorus is weakly, uh, uh, frequently on the ward, move them to the ICU. A little bit more in fulminant hepatic failure. We're going to give these patients lots of nutrition. Not only do they need phosphorus repletion, but they need tube, tube feeds. They need 3,000 calories a day to regenerate that liver. I had a patient who ate through 400 millimoles of phosphorus, tube feeds, walked out of the hospital. He was not a candidate because it looked like he was a Tylenol overdose, probably a suicide um, attempt. Antibiotics only for infection, but in these patients, they're in the ICU for more than three days, you need to be doing surveillance cultures. Gastric pH, if there's an NG tube down. PPIs, very selectively, but can be used if there's a risk for peptic disease. Good skin care, O threshold for a liver biopsy, and of course, liver transplant evaluation. Alpha beta proteins, very useful for regeneration marker. High AFP means that liver is going to recover more likely. Factor five and factor seven levels are liver function tests and very useful as a prognostic marker. 
King's criteria for acetaminophen on the left, non-acetaminophen on the right, taking these different factors in. Acetaminophen toxicity, we can miss this. They come in four, five, six days after chronic acetaminophen exposure at six grams a day for three months. We're gonna put everybody on N-acetylcysteine with acute liver failure now. I even use N-acetylcysteine for alcoholic hepatitis. And I'm going to wrap this up in about five minutes because is that correct, Pedram, that we need to finish by 1.15 or do I need to finish sooner? What's your guidance? Um, well, how much, do you have another lecture you need to go through too is no, or no? I'm pretty much wrapped up now. We've covered most of the salient issues. Do you want to switch to Q&A right now? Um, sure, yeah. We can switch to Q&A and then try to see where that leads us. Okay, let's do that. We've covered a huge number of pearls. I'm quite happy with uh, what we've covered. There's a lot more in this deck, but let's go to Q&A now. That's great advice. I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah, let's do the Q&A now, and if we have any more time and there's no questions, I'll cover a little bit more. Oh, sure. I think Dr. Farr had a question. Yeah, Bob, that was a great talk, and uh, I really... Glad you brought up the issue about ammonia levels. Uh, we've had, actually, with the residents did a QI project looking at ammonia levels uh, being done in the emergency room way too much. And obviously, hepatic encephalopathy is really a clinical diagnosis. You don't make that diagnosis on an elevated ammonia level. So that was a really important pearl. The other thing, I, you may have mentioned it. I, I, I stepped out for a second. But the issue about protein restriction was taught many years ago. We do not, obviously these patients are very malnourished. They need, don't need restriction. They need a lot of protein. They need a balanced diet. Absolutely. So I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah. 100 to 120 grams of protein a day is standard of care. No protein restriction. Great point. Right. Yeah. Um, I have a question in that, you know, with large volume paracentesis, we, um, um, give back albumin. However, if the patients are more advanced and are getting lower um, paracentesis um, for therapeutic reasons, lower volumes, is there an indication for albumin if it's not large volume? Uh, it's a great question. So let's say someone's coming in twice a week getting three liters taken off. In an ideal world, they would be getting albumin each time they come in. And the reasoning is, is they're already severely protein calorie malnourished. It's hard mm -hmm. for them to become anabolic. Although this is a great time to discuss what I call the cirrhosis diet. Everybody with cirrhosis, every patient should be eating seven snacks a day, not three meals. It should be spread out over seven snacks. They should be definitely getting in at least 25 kcals per kilo. They should be on 100 gram to 120 gram protein diet, high complex carbohydrate, low fat. So this is pasta, bread, rice, potatoes with protein, vegetable protein preferred, whey protein, Ensure, um, tofu, uh, soy-based powders, and avoiding, should be no red meat, avoiding chicken and fish, sorry, chicken and pork, preferably fish and vegetable-based diet. That's the cirrhosis diet. That helps make people become anabolic because they're, you're treating their intermittent hypoglycemia. So cirrhosis diet, spread the word, no protein restriction. Thanks. Um, Hi, Dr. Gish. Um, I'm Mohammed Hassan, one of the inpatient uh, faculty. Thank you very much for uh, this really uh, immense, like, really information that are very useful, especially the for the inpatient setting. One thing I want to uh, 